items. Number one, request by staff 2019-20, compensation bulletin for non-represented staff. This came before executive committee October 10 for approval. Approval of this item would approve the 2019-2020 compensation bulletin for non-represented staff as attached to this school board action report with any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and to take any necessary actions to implement the document. I see Chief Financial Officer Jolynn Berge at the podium. Take it away, please. All right, good evening. Uh, this board action report makes changes to the compensation bulletin for non-represented staff, which include um, a salary increase of 2.5% to address salary compression, related to other negotiated salary increases. Uh, the second item, School Employee Benefits Board, and there's new health care language that needs to be added. And as we know, um, SEB is effective January 1, 2020. It makes changes to annual leave termination cash out. It changes the work year when there are more than 260 days to align with represented 260-day employees. It expands sick leave allowable use to align with state law. And finally, uh, VEBA, which is the Voluntary Employees Beneficiary Association, uh, requires a plan hold harmless agreement required for sick leave when an employee leaves the district, so a technical amendment to VEBA requirements. Uh, executive committee members asked to have the current and proposed salary schedules included in the bar. This has been done, as well as adding language that a market study will be conducted during the spring of 2020. That's now included. I would note the following um, data has been provided to support the 2.5% salary increase. First, turnover in central office at 25% significantly outpaces teacher and principal turnover at 10% and 15% respectively. There is a table showing a comparison of compensation increases over time, which show that since 1516, teacher salaries have increased by 32%. And while not included on the chart, principal salaries have increased by 23.5% during the same time frame. With the increase requested, non-represented compensation increases for the same period of time would be increased by 14.1%, of which 9.1% has been the state inflationary pass-through increases. That would conclude my remarks. We had a rich and somewhat difficult conversation in an executive committee because <coughs> out in the community, oftentimes we are told that our highest paid central office staff um, are already being paid above market rate. Um, can you talk about other similar districts, not Marysville and two or three others that are listed here? And again, I appreciate the amendment that we would do a class and comp study. Um, can, can you talk about that piece and also the piece for our highest paid managerial staff and income disparity, which is certainly an issue in the news nationally and locally, please. Sure, there are several other districts who have been making, um, I would say, they've made higher increases over that same amount of time. I don't have specifics, but we know that we are competing against other districts. And I would just say, I'd offer two other pieces of data, please, to that point. So if you annualize the teacher salary schedule that just went into place at the highest cell and step, if you annualize that salary, it's just over $150,000 a year for that teacher. And currently our principal's salary tops out at about $163,000 a year. So those two pools of people we're recruiting out of to come to central office and lead wide span of control and scope activities for our entire district not just a classroom, not just a building, but the entire district. So when you have principals that are coming Can we say in, not just A because those are so critical? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, so that's really when you have an architecture structure to a salary schedule. You're kind of all connected on a train. 
Uh, and what we have right now is we have situations where we have teachers or um, represented staff making more that not more than non-represented staff who are in higher level positions or their supervisors or things like that. So this makes some of those corrections. But again, it really is trying to address the compression that occurs as we continue to adjust our other um, collective bargaining agreement salaries. There has to be something that comes along for a central office as well to be able to fill those positions. And I think we're struggling right now with the 25% turnover rate. I think that that probably speaks for itself. And do we know how much of the 25% turnover rate are lesser paid administrative manager staff as opposed to chiefs, directors, executive directors? I don't I, have I'm trying to lay a record here because I anticipate some pretty vociferous pushback sure. and and so I would like to lay a record that talks about if we do this why we do this so now I've lost my train of thought <laughs> I there uh, is a lot of other data that sits in the bar so we talk about when we're making job offer it's across the board I don't know specifics on which area is churning faster than another area. I think that we can say that I have had turnover personally in accounting staff. Um, I've had turnover, you know, we've had turnover at the executive level to a high degree as well. So it's across the district. The jobs here at central office aren't easy. They're the ones that we cut first, that everyone wants to cut first. And so oftentimes we have fewer people doing the same amount of work and that work gets spread out amongst those same people. And so their scope of um, responsibility will grow. And again, we're, we're trying to you know, have a library program manager who's a librarian teacher come out of the classroom and work a lot more days and not make any more money. So those are the, some of the adjustments that we're talking about making and it kind of goes along. If you have then a one program manager, you can't leave the others behind. If they're doing similar type of work, you have to pay them as well. Director Geary? I, um, I am looking at a document, it's page 22 of the bar, comparison of compensation increases over time. Mm -hmm. um, am I correct? It says SEA total percent increases per CBA from 2015 to 20 over a five year total is a 32.1% increase, whereas our non rep increases have only been 14.1%. That, that's if the additional 2.5% for this year were approved. If that were not approved, we'd be sitting at 11, 11%. 11.6. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I understood. Yep. Other comments, questions, concerns from my colleagues, Director Mack or Director Burke? Seeing none, moving on, thank you very much. Number two, 2019-20 legislative agenda. This came before executive committee, October 10 for approval. Approval of this item would adopt the 2019-20 legislative agenda as attached to the board action report. Who is speaking to this and presenting? I will speak to this. Super, thank you. Yay. Um, with some, I'm going to acknowledge that Erin Bennett did provide some talking points and she and Jill and Bergier are here to answer any additional questions. First thing is that um, in creating this legislative agenda, um, we are looking at two overriding principles. One, that we shape the legislative agenda to um, align with our strategic plan. And the other is that even in aligning with it, we keep it broad enough so that it provides guidance to the district on any number of issues that might come up during the legislative session so that it is both broad but tailored to our legislative agenda. So um, with that in mind, we have provide services, supports, and staffing for the whole child to eliminate the opportunity gap, which is in align with number one, high quality instruction and learning. And so we are looking at um, providing for all the uh, academic, social, cultural, emotional, behavioral needs of students in every school. 
Um, again, we're going to be looking specifically at things um, providing for student need, those um, programs that we have traditionally heard are rather, uh, that we're underfunded for including special education and English language learners, and including as well the highly capable program to make sure that we have um, the resources necessary to do the differentiation in our schools. And then um, looking uh, to enable that which is necessary to enable warm, welcoming, and safe learning environments. Then under uh, predictable and consistent operations, we're looking to increase state funding to reflect true cost of capital facilities, update the state's outdated school construction assistance program, and provide uh, directed state capital assistance. And then to ensure high quality for a culturally responsive workforce, ensure high quality and culturally responsive educators in every classroom, we're looking to support competitive salaries and professional development, promote strategies for equitable student outcomes, and fully fund the cost of implementing the School Employee Benefit Board, or SEP, program. So that is, generally speaking, our legislative agenda. Again, it's broad, but tailored to our uh, strategic plan. And while it is not as presented in the bar, um, we're looking for a more graphically pleasing addition between now and action. Ms. Bennett, could you tell us how many education bills landed in the last legislative session ballpark? Uh, good evening, Erin Bennett, Executive Director of Government Relations and Strategic Initiatives. So this is off of the top of my head, so. Guesstimate. 300-ish. Uh, Thank you. Director Mack, did you have anything to add? Um, yeah, uh, I think you did a great overview. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's actually to tack on to the question that President Harris just asked. Uh, one of the things that one of the members of the uh, WASDA Legislative Committee has been working on is um, actually tracking all of the <coughs> um, bills that have been passed and mandates that have been passed that haven't necessarily have any dollars attached to them. Um, and someone took the time to go through that from, you know, from the past 10 years or so. And the book is so large, it's kind of unwieldy. So um, there's a lot that comes through that we need to, you know, be responsive to during the legislative session. And, um, uh, you know, definitely appreciate Aaron's uh, work and our lobbyist work, as well as um, Chief Bergie. Um, on, you know, the, the amount of brain power and time it takes to, to vet these things as they're coming through in legislative session and work with us on this. So um, I'm feeling really great about where this uh, is, how, how it's stated, as uh, Director Geary said, both aligned with our strategic plan and broadly focused. Um, we had a great, robust discussion in executive committee about it and um, just looking to see if any directors have any further questions or concerns. Director DeWolf, at one point you had the mic. Please. I was just gonna say that we had added a word at exec, or a couple of words at exec for section two bullet, cipher point two, which was just an addition, critical capacity, safety, security, and environmental sustainability needs. So just really grateful we could add that. And I appreciate your motion to do so, kind sir. Thank you. Good catch. Okay. Seeing no other further comment, questions, concerns, we move to number three. Approval of the Washington State Auditor's SAO Annual Audit Services Contract for the 2018-19 Fiscal Year Audit. This came before ANF October 7th for... Approval. Approval of this item would authorize the superintendent reimburse the Washington State Auditor's Office for its services up to the amount of $340,130 for the district's 2018-19 fiscal year audit. Chief Berge, this is a non-negotiable issue, correct? Yes, correct. Same as our discussion this, last year and the year this before. This is compliance. Correct. And we have to pass this because it's state law, correct? 
Correct. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns? Say, uh, please, go for it. Uh, audit and finance, and it's not that it's to hold it up, but I do think it is interesting. The law requires it every three years, and we do it every year. And uh, Jalyn Berge explained that that is very common of the bigger districts like ours, but I, I do just raise that because by law, it could happen as infrequently as every three years. <coughs> Director Pinkham? I, I did correct the typo that you had requested yeah. at Audit and Finance Director Pinkham. Thank you. Moving on, number four, renewal of Microsoft software agreement. This came before ANF October 7th for <coughs> consideration. consideration. Approval of this item would approve a three-year contract for the Microsoft software license agreement with software reseller Dell Computer Corp in the amount of $952,091.77 paid annually for a total amount of $2,856,275.31 with a not to exceed NTE clause of $3,570,344.14 to cover increases during the three-year period. Materials were updated October 16, 2019. CFO Berge, take it away, please. Sure. This covers all Microsoft um, Office applications as well as server software and client licensing. The bid process had not yet been completed. We were still negotiating terms and conditions, but we have completed that. So at the time of audit and finance, they were under discussion. That's been completed. It's Dell Computer Corporation is the successful bidder. Uh, as you stated, um, <coughs> Director Harris, the not to exceed amount includes 25% increase for additional devices that are projected to be added, as well as new licensing requests and new products, if, if they have other updates to that. Um, we also did include some changes that were noted in audit and finance. There is a table now that outlines prior three-year agreement costs, current three-year agreement costs, the antivirus costs that Director Mack had asked to be outlined as well. Comments, questions, concerns from my colleagues? Director yeah. Mack, Director Burke, you there? Hello? Yep. Director Mack? I'm yeah, here. I'm here. Um, okay. We had conversation in committee around this, uh, and I appreciate that the bar was updated to have a chart that uh, expresses what the past cost was and the total future cost. Um, going forward. Um, I guess I am a little confused on the um, what is in here now because the total amount is a million over what it was for the last three years and my understanding was that there's some products that we were paying for separately that are all rolled in um, and I'm wondering if all this products that were being paid for separately were included in this chart or are we really going to be uh, paying a million dollars more and for what reason? We really are going to be paying a million dollars more. We're covering more devices, we're covering more students, we're covering more staff, um, as well as the products that are available for phishing protection and antivirus have made leaps and bounds improvements and they have new products that keep our district more safe um, in those areas. So those additional services that are now available and they're more robust are included in this contract amount. This is, um, it's super important that we try to protect our district's data <laughs> as uh, best we can. Uh, I'm sorry if I, I didn't mean, I hope I'm not cutting you off. I, I am having a little bit of a difficult time hearing. Um, did you say that some of it is an increase in the number of um, the number of uh, computers that we're actually providing service for? Is part of this increase because we've actually increased the number of laptops that are available one to one for some students in some school? Yes. It, basically, is there there's there's an increase here also because of the number of um, computers that will have the licensing agreements. Is that correct? Correct. 
Okay, Director Pinkham, please. Actually, yeah, uh, Director Mack brought up the point I wanted to make sure wasn't was pointed out that we are getting this fishing and antivirus protection in this new package, and and the increased costs is more reflection of more computers, not of increased costs in the fishing and virus protection. I would say that it's all uh, some of all of that. Not seeing any more comments, cons questions, concerns from my colleagues. We move to number five, and see F. O. Berge stays at the podium. Number five, contract for Sprig Israel Giles Benefits Administration Services came before ANF October 7 for consideration. Approval of this item would authorize the superintendent to execute a contract with Sprague Israel Giles in the estimated amount of $481,800 or $5.50 per eligible employee for benefits administration services in the form of the draft agreement effective January 1, 2020, attached to the school board action report with any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and to take any necessary actions to implement the contract. Take it away, CFO Berge. All right, first, um, there's been an updated version. We had some requests at Audit and Finance to increase the background uh, language to cover that it's an unfunded mandate and the cost of going to the SEB, the School Employees Benefits Board, is about $8 million. So we've included that language. The number of staff that are not covered by the state allocation, which is the reason we have the $8 million cost, is also um, noted now in this document. And we have expanded the purpose of what Sprague Israel Giles, what the interface is with our employees. <clears throat> so beginning in January 2020, all school districts are required to transition to the new state healthcare system administered by the SEB. SEB's information and support is either all online or to be provided by school district's benefit staff, of which we have one. Um, so SIG, Sprague Israel Giles, has been providing this service for our district for about 15 years via the benefits helpline, as well as compiling enrollment and eligibility files for our providers. Under this contract, SIG would continue to provide contracted services, including data reporting for enrollment and eligibility to SEB, as well as phone line support, which SEB is not providing to school district staff. Just as a data note, in the first two days of open enrollment for SEB, um, Sprague Israel Giles reported receiving 240 calls from Seattle Public Schools employees with questions. Uh, and I will take any questions at this point. Thanks. Questions, comments, concerns <coughs> from my colleagues? Directors Mack or Burke? Sprague Israel Giles has given us great service over the years, 15 years, is that correct? Excellent. Okay, and did we put this contract out to bid or did we do a sole source? We did a sole source for this one year. Um, once we kind of have the lay of the land settled, we'll be looking at an RFP again next spring okay. for the same service. After we kind of determine um, do we need the same level of service, what does that look like? We need to keep evaluating and it. I hate to do this to you, but we are making a record. Okay. Can you talk about the extraordinary change for SEP? How this is a really big deal? Yeah, um, all school districts negotiated their own health care, and so the legislature passed a bill that said beginning in January, everyone goes to this new state health care system. So all school district employees will have the same health care um, system and health care providers. This means that there are different costs. So some of our employees may have been paying zero. Now they'll have a cost that maybe is $15 a month. So there's some pretty low cost options available if you're covering yourself. But one of the SEB's large benefits is that the cost to cover your family could go from $1,000 a month to $200 a month. So it really changes. <laughs> It really changes and brings um, a lot of our staff who are um, lower, they're in lower paid positions, could not afford to cover their families. And under this new state law change, they will be able to afford to cover their families. It does also provide benefits, full health care benefits to any employee who works 630 hours or more, including substitutes which is a great policy, it's just unfunded. We have about 500 more people who will qualify for benefits, 
past what the state actually is paying us for funding. Ballpark figure of the unfunded portion of the mandate, please. $8 million a year. Thank you, Olympia. Number six, annual approval of programs or schools using the alternative learning experience ALE model and review of policy 2255, alternative learning experience, schools or programs. This came before CNI October 8th for? Approval. Approval of this item would approve the alternative learning experience of the Cascade Partnership Program, Interagency Academy School, Nova High School, the Nova Project High School, Middle College School in the form of the plans and annual reports for each school attached to the board action report with such minor additions, deletions, and modifications as the superintendent deems necessary and directs the superintendent to implement such plans and pursuant to the school board review conducted, agree to make no change changes to policy number 2255, alternative learning experience schools or programs. CAO DeBacker, take it away. Um, this did come before CNI a few weeks ago and you heard from three of the principals as they described their programs and they are also described in detail. A few things that are new to this um, that we have not had in years past is that we did add into <coughs> the bar the racial equity analysis um, for this and that's consistent with our strategic plan. Uh, there was a question from Dr. Perry from NOVA about the, uh, the challenges with enrollment. We've since worked with enrollment about that, and um, I think we have those ironed out, or at least um, we're aware of the problems now. Nothing further at this point. So would one of the threads between all of these different programs be the rolling enrollment, where enrollment is open all year long, because of the unique needs of these programs? Yes. Director DeWolf, please. Um, I just want to use this as an opportunity to elevate um, Nova High School um, through our Families Education Preschool Promise Levy was awarded some seed funding, <coughs> one third for their health clinic. There was also some additional funding, $100,000 that came through the city council to kind of refresh their space. Um, do you have any update on the progress of that? Because this is, you know, a new school year, and I think particularly as we think about these schools, they're safe spaces, identity safe schools, particularly for LGBTQ folks at Nova High School, and my main concern is that we continue to delay the health clinic and the construction or remodel for that. And again, I know this is not necessarily part of that bar, but as an opportunity to say, to support this type of academic environment, one crucial part of that is to make sure we follow through on our promise for that health clinic. I have no updates, but I can find out. Chief Podesta, do you have any updates? Okay. Director Pinkham. Uh, yes, uh, can I get some clarification? And I brought this up at the CNI meeting you know, about in some documents, when it's a small n of number of students, we don't share that information, but in this one, we are. Can you just you know, provide clarification why we're able to share it in this one, but we don't do it in others? I do not have a response for that at this time. <coughs> Is that a Friday <coughs> memo follow-up both on the um, status of the health clinic at the Nova Project High School and the N numbers not necessarily being consistent <coughs> across our data reporting? Is that a fair way to say it? Yes. Can we? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, because yeah, in the Thank past you. when I think Director DeWolf uh, mentioned too that sometimes uh, American Indians are just left out when there's a small number. We say, okay, we can't report it because it could be identical information, but at least let's acknowledge you're there. Uh, but then here in this document, we're seeing twos, threes, and those are the small ends typically that you run across. <coughs> Other comments, questions, concerns? Seeing none, moving on. Number seven, six through 12, Spanish instructional materials adoption came before CNI October 8th for? Approval. Approval of this item would approve the Spanish instructional materials adoption committee's recommendation for instructional materials for all middle and high school Spanish world language Seattle Public Schools SPS classrooms. Take it away if you can. I will uh, do my best to not cough in your ear. Would you like us to move to another 
item. That so would be great. Okay, Thank let's you. do that and we'll circle back. That you are not presenting. I was gonna, and the next couple items are mine, so yeah. Okay, well then let's go to number 10, BTA 3, BTA 4. Resolutions 2019-20-7, final acceptance of contract P1448 with KCDA William Scotsman, Inc. to provide for the move and set up of portable classroom modules at multiple school, school sites for the 2016-17 school year. This came before OPS October 3rd for approval. Approval of this item would adopt resolution 2019-20-7 and accept the work performed under contract P1448 with KCDA Williams Scotman's, Scotsman's Inc. to provide for the move and set up of portable classroom modules, modules at multiple school sites project as final. Chief Podesta. Uh, this is again a final acceptance of the contract that purchased five portables and then located 26 portables at 11 different schools. Oh. Um, for prior school years, the work was completed satisfactorily. We occupied the portables, and all that's left is. Final so this acceptance. is a compliance issue, correct? Yes. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns. Seeing none, moving on to 11 BTA 4 resolution 2019-20-8 final acceptance of contract K5093 with KCDA William Scotsman's. Is this the same thing? This but is, a different contract is number 10? This is a 10? different contract for a different set of portables at different schools. And is Chief Narver in the room? I feel comfortable then accepting your explanation for the last issue. Number 12, approval of property alterations valued at $400,000 at Memorial Stadium. This came before OPS October 3rd for approval. Approval of this item would authorize the superintendent to approve property alterations valued in the amount of $400,000 to be made by Alpha Entertainment to Memorial Stadium as detailed in the rental agreement attached to the school board action report. And welcome, Mr. Zorn. Thank you. Uh, we're joined today by uh, head coach and general manager of the Seattle Dragons, a uh, new XFL uh, franchise that is, will be doing business in Seattle. Um, we offer Memorial Stadium to lots of groups and have a standard um, uh, rent schedule that we use for use of the stadium for athletic purposes. Um, the XFL approached us, would like to take advantage of that opportunity to uh, rent the stadium as a practice field from um, December through April for the next two seasons um, and we'll pay those fees as we've offered to others including the uh, recently departed Seattle Rain. Um, in addition, they'll be making some tenant improvements and leave behind some durable goods for us, uh, air conditioning systems, uh, uh, telecommunications improvements, make some uh, improvements to our locker facilities that you know, we, we will enjoy after they use. And um, that we desperately need. Uh, the stadium can use whatever um, love we can give it. And um, <laughs> these are times that we work closely with athletics to make sure these are times when the field is not otherwise occupied. Um, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions, and I uh, think Coach Zorn would be as well. Director DeWolf. Thanks, President Harris. Can you, I'm sorry, what was your name? I didn't get your name. Jim Zorn, C-O-R-N. Cool. Well, thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, particularly in the background section, it shares the alterations uh, that the XFL will be making, but can you describe some of the things that you won't be doing? I'm particularly um, want to be thoughtful about the fact that at least when I've heard from the community there's certain parts they don't want messed with, and I think part of that's the wall. We, so, are, you know, nothing, this is not, a, these are uh, tenant improvements, these are systems like air conditioners. We are not making any substantial changes to Memorial Stadium. We will not be touching the Memorial Wall. We would not be anything, doing anything that would uh, require building inspectors to come and permit our facility and address all the other things. These are. Um, not insignificant improvements, but again, there are things like air conditioning compressors, ice machines, whirlpools, but the, and there'll be some temporary structures that the XFL uses that will come and go um, while they're occupying um, the facility perhaps, but, but not, it, it's not a fundamental change to the stadium. It's awesome. paint, floors, finishes, and furnishing. So it's a good deal for us, and um, it, you know, it, it's, uh, it's 
good that the stadium is being used. Thank you. Is there a chance we could come visit when it's altered? Okay, cool. <laughs> you're going to put you through a workout if you're not careful, pal. <laughs> Other questions, comments, concerns from my colleagues? Director Pinkham, please. Sure. So this will just be for practice and the actual games are will be held at a separate facility? At, at CenturyLink Field. CenturyLink Field. Okay. And welcome, Mr. Zorn. I, I grew up watching you when you are with the CSF yes. then. <laughs> okay. Are there no further questions? We'll it see you in two weeks. It does not appear there are further questions. Great. Thank you. Two a days. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Student assignment transition plan number thirteen. Or are you are you in a position to where you feel comfortable? Okay. Well, we're flexible. We'll work with you. Uh, yes. Thank you for the water, the rest, and the cough drop. Okay. We already put um, Spanish instructional materials on the dais here. Um, questions, comments, concerns from my colleagues? I have one. We heard earlier tonight in public testimony about CCC curriculum adoption and folks have taken um, a really significant look at CCC and found a disproportionate uh, percentage of white authors and um, have we looked at this curriculum written by native speakers or folks of Latinx or Latinx or Hispanic backgrounds? Um, in response to or, or uh, just to talk a little bit about the CCC um, what was said in public comment is exactly right, and we have discovered that we, um, there are not enough materials there, uh, stu uh, people of color. We have um, worked in collaboration with Kathleen Vasquez through Tracy um, Castro-Gale, and um, we have a list of things that we would like to do there. That will require a fiscal note. That will require us coming back in front of the board and saying that we need to amend the adoption so if you think about 2015 that you just passed that would allow us to to come back in and do that so we we're aware of that we're working on it I'm not sure what our plan forward is okay so that's for CCC now I'm right. asking specifically whether or not we've done that kind of analysis for this curriculum adoption I can speak to it on um, from the fact or just looking at the uh, the committee members I know that director Pinkham asked about this at CNI as to whether or not we had um, people of, of uh, Spanish type heritage in order uh, on our committee and we did um, I don't know if we've looked at it in terms of what was brought up in public comment so we have two weeks before this comes mm -hmm. to us for action can we do a review because we had phenomenal people working very hard on the CCC adoption as well and I think thankfully we're learning as we go and and I'd like to make that a priority if that's possible if it's not possible please tell us so I think it's possible yes other comments questions concerns from my colleagues and this is um, Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Director Ma Yes, hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Um, actually, kind of tacking on to that same line of questioning around um, how the curriculum has been um, evaluated in the context of native Spanish speakers, and I'm curious to know whether or not um, the uh, The curriculum as it's being adopted and expected to be purchased, whether or not the uh, amount of it in the various levels has been um, counted to ensure that 
for example, maybe all of the native Spanish speakers that would want to take Spanish for um, to brush up and be, you know, ready to take the exam, um, that that would, that we are, we are accounting for planning for that in the future. Does, it, does my question make sense? I'm sorry if it doesn't. I can clarify. Uh, clarification, please. I'm sorry? Yes. Clarify, please. I, I'm sorry. I'm having, are you? Uh, we're asking you to clarify your question because we're not tracking. Not quite understanding. Okay. I, I'm looking here at the recommended motion, and it says specific materials to be approved for Spanish 1, 2, and 3. Uh, Spanish 4 and also IP Spanish 4 and AP for AP Spanish 5. Um, and my assumption in understanding what these materials are, it's grades 6 through 12, um, that it is for uh, non-native speakers to learn Spanish, which would be the 1, 2, and 3 classes, uh, but also for the dual language speakers that would be in advanced classes 4 and 5 or the AP Spanish 5 classes. And we simultaneously have now an um, exam that native speakers can take to get credit for their uh, native language speaking. And so for Spanish speakers, um, I was curious to know whether or not we are planning for or considering that as an elective, those Spanish speakers prior to taking that exam might uh, benefit from taking Spanish 5 or whatever highest level it is so that they would be, you know, fully prepped um, to take that exam in the future. And whether or not when we're thinking about and have planned for the number of materials to be purchased, if we, we have been thinking about providing that in the future. I am. This is this is Diane DeBacker. I'm not sure that that specifically was brought up during the adoption process. Um, if you'll recall, we did switch um, in terms of resources from it being focused on levels four and five to be focused on levels one, two, and three because that's where the bulk of the enrollment is. Um, I think based upon your question this would not prevent any student who is a native speaker from taking four and five and maybe assisting them as they take that um, exam. Um, but I'm not sure that that was specifically addressed during the adoption process. Uh, thank, thank you. I, I do think it would be helpful to have, keep that in, that in mind going forward as um, as we think about the dual language support uh, for our English language learners and, and helping them to maintain their learning in their native language as well. Director Pinkham, then Director Deary. Uh, thank you. So to kind of uh, clarify, if I wasn't clear when at the CNI meeting, I was wondering how many of the members on the board were Spanish was their native language, not that they were from a Spanish heritage, but Spanish was their native language was the question I'm trying to get a clarification on. Uh, we will we'll go back to that because that is not what we answered for you. Yeah, so I do see the chart that lists you know, probably uh, the Hispanic Latinx heritage uh, on, on this. Um, so if you, I think it would be interesting to know how many of those just say X were Spanish native speakers. Yes. Director Geary. Um, you can also go on to the Vista Higher Learning website and look at the products. Um, they have them there. They are compilation products, so not series of individually written books like the CCC um, curriculum, just getting to your point. Mm -hmm. And within these compilation books, they do have articles that are, it appears to have been written by Latinx people on different topics. I just share that because if you want to explore further, you can actually see the products online. Thank you. Other questions, comments, concerns from my colleagues? 
Director DeWolf, you are excused. Number eight, approval of the 2019-20 District Educational Research and Program Evaluation Plan. This came before CNI. Approval. October 8th for approval. You pause. <laughs> approval of this item would approve the 2019-20 District Educational Research and Program Evaluation Plan as attached to the board action report. Comments, questions, concerns from my colleagues? Director Geary. I will just reiterate that um, it's, it looked like it was a very ambitious plan, um, but we were reassured in CNI that Eric Anderson thought that they could do the work. Other comments, questions, concerns from my colleagues? Directors Burke and Mack, you still there? Yep, uh, I made all my comments and introductions, so thank you very much. Okay, this is introduction. This is a, it's, it's, at CNI. Sorry, at, at, at the conversation in committee. Thank you, sir. Um, I gotta do this because I've been asking for two, three years for the evaluation of Honors for All. And I truly appreciate folks are working hard. I truly appreciate that we have limited bandwidth and that we have no end of priorities. When are we getting that evaluation? And it's particularly important given the rest of our policy work that's going forth and how do we measure whether or not we've been successful on MTSS? And I believe that there is, in fact, a policy that required us to evaluate that. I'll refer you to page three <coughs> of, the, uh, of the bar where Dr. Anderson has set out all of the different projects that will be worked on this coming year and that have been worked on previously. If you'll notice, the last one talks about strategic research and is titled Detracking. So the official review of that did not begin until 20 this past school year. You will be getting a report on that, on the initial findings um, in the next month. That will be in a Friday memo. Um, and will and it be data heavy or will it be anecdotal heavy? Uh, it's a little, uh, it has both. You will see both. Um, I have, I've seen it already and so as um, a, a, a small group from curriculum assessment and instruction, um, we would like to continue that for a second year. So again, as you look on page three, you'll see that we think that we need to do a second year of that. Um, so, so that is ongoing. Comments, questions, concerns from my colleagues? Seeing none, we move to number nine, revisions to board policy 2022, electronic resources and use of the internet came before CNI October 8th for consideration. <laughs> Approval of this item would revise board policy 2022, electronic resources and use of the internet as attached to the board action report. Who's presenting on this? Mr. Burke, I, I will do my batter best up. This, I will do my best to tee this up remotely. Um, so the high point: this policy came to CNI a few months for a couple of months earlier this year uh, under uh, Kyle Kenosha's leadership. There were several changes drafted, including terminology updates to align with WASDA model policy and recent legislation, and also to clarify the scope of digital resources and the relation to this policy 2015 that we just approved around adoption of digital instructional materials. So that was the easy part. The challenging part is related to the use of, uh, student use of personal electronic devices during school hours. Um, and at committee, we talked about a range of ideas ranging from uh, delegating the guidance on personal electronic devices to individual schools, and then also establishing a district-wide policy guidance um, and so currently, you know, our landscape is that 
schools, districts, and even entire countries are applying um, restrictions or limitations on portable electronic devices, especially smartphones. And so um, at that time, this was in, in May, policy language was drafted, actually prior to May, was drafted for a district-wide limitation on use of personal electronic devices for grades K through eight. Uh, that language was shared via survey with teachers, principals, and several community organizations. Uh, feedback from that engagement was, was somewhat divided with, um, as spelled out in the bar with teachers and principals slightly favoring uh, prohibition and community feedback um, not, not as much in support. They were, um, the feedback was, the community was not in support of the language that was presented. So at that time, um, and given the need to create thoughtful implementation plans, it really wasn't a viable issue for this 2019-20 start of school. Uh, so it was tabled or deferred by the CNI committee uh, back in May for more time pressing topics. So this was brought back to CNI um, before the end of this year with the goal to complete the work stream under the current board, uh, but also to provide staff with sufficient time to develop procedure and roll this out to schools in a thoughtful manner. So implementation should this um, bar be passed, implementation through superintendent procedure would be the critical next step, which ideally would include surveys of our school administration about their current policy language uh, with a goal of harmonizing that um, to reduce disruption. And then also, as we discussed in CNI committee, it's imperative that that implementation uh, be intentional so that we do not uh, create a disproportionate discipline around this topic. Director Hersey. Yes, <clears throat> so thanks for that. Um, thanks for that background, Director Burke. Uh, my question is, so it sounds like the community is for the most part not necessarily feeling this. And then we have slightly favoring from educators and principals. So my question is, it doesn't seem like there is strong enough community support or staff support to move forward. And based on the conversations that I've had with educators and principals, it seems like, especially on the elementary school level, that a lot of schools have either figured out policies that already work for them, or I just haven't heard a significant amount of, yes, this is, this is what we want and this is what we're aiming for. So can you, can you be a little more specific on what are some of the things that you have heard from uh, specific either staff who are supporting this, principals who are supporting this, because at this phase, it doesn't seem like there is enough backing to, for me personally, to, to look at this in a way that could move forward. Um, absolutely, yeah, I'll, I'll share what I know at this time, you know, the data that that's in the bar, um, the principals are 55% in support of prohibition and teachers are 70% are, uh, in support of prohibition. The genesis for this really came when I was um, doing the, uh, on the superintendent tour, um, where I, I had the pleasure of visiting Mercer Middle School and they had a, a sign in their window around their use of uh, personal electronic devices and, and student technology and it was it was very what I thought was it was very eloquent um, and, and age appropriate and respectful and I Mercer is one of our um, you know one of our leadership schools in uh, closing gaps and taking initiative around sometimes the, the more challenging topics and I thought wow that's that's a beacon of of leadership there, um, and so the idea of, of applying that in a broader sense uh, sort of took seed there. Uh, since that time, some of our other schools, I know that Hamilton has adopted their away for the day policy, and everybody that I've spoke to at the school, whether it's teachers or um, parents, have said that the, the student impact has been positive. That um, students are spending less time on their phones and more time with their friends um, in actual conversations. And I've heard similar, again, only anecdotal 
feedback from the um, changes in the policy at Roosevelt High School that put um, more limitations on the use of, of personal electronic devices. So I know that that is a you know that is a, a, a limited case. Uh, I also know that in Everett uh, and I believe also in Muckleteo, I had some other districts, but I can't get to my network connection. Um, the you know those are districts that did um, district wide adoption, uh, and I think there's there's a always an initial concern or a bow wave of um, uh, sort of fear or dissent, and I think that reaching out. To, uh, to understand what that is about and making sure that our implementation is respectful and that we are putting student safety first and that we're acknowledging uh, you know, the, the, the concerns and the trust of our family that you know, they want to know where their kids are and that their kids are safe and that they're able to reach them um, in cases of emergency. So a lot of that is really around how do we implement and I think that's where our schools have a lot of experience. Director Geary. M my concern, and we discussed this a little bit in committee and we did change, it was in the um, rights and responsibilities, the language with regard to it now being in the superintendent procedures. But I'm still, um, and, and the reason for that switch is that once it goes into rights and responsibilities, that is our discipline document and it, the only other um, things that we prohibit akin to discipline are drugs and weapons. And so to elevate cell phones or personal electronic devices to that level seems um, inappropriate. And even prohibiting is again, it, it, for me that language puts the onus on the students rather than on the schools itself. And so I'm gonna be putting forward an amendment to that particular portion that will require schools to create policies that protect distraction-free environments for our students with regard to these electronic devices, but not using the word prohibit students because especially when I, we're looking at middle school, while, um, I understand there are a lot of benefits and I can, I can totally see how that would be true. We're also talking about a population that is coming into its own. It has a certain amount of foreseeable um, oppositionality. It is a group of students who are trying to individuate themselves and oftentimes they see their phone or their personal electronic device as a really powerful tool in their independence and the motivations for them to continue to carry those and potentially get in trouble with regard to doing something that has been prohibited on a district level seems to be creating um, a situation that requires discipline rather than necessarily conversation and understanding so I guess at this point, I still don't trust that we have done enough race and equity training, enough anti-bias training, um, any of those things, even elevating students in terms of the respect that they require um, given different cultures. I don't think we, we've, we're at the point where we're gonna prohibit this thing. Right. So I would like us to s switch the onus to require our schools to have policies to protect the learning environment because those are the adults and that's where the responsibility um, lies. So I will be putting that out. It, it's gonna be a very minor modification to the overall policy, but you can expect that because I won't, I won't vote for something like this. It, Director, it, I'm sorry, didn't mean to cut you off, you're good? Director Hersey. Yeah, and just another piece of that, and this was sparked by Director Geary's comments, it seems to me <clears throat> with what I'm reading here is that we're, we're moving into um, a lands an educational landscape and a societal landscape that kids are gonna have phones younger and younger. And I, and I think that what I'm thinking of is how are we, how are we educating our students on how to use them properly 
rather than prohibiting, right? Because as technology comes more and more into the classroom, I mean, I, I see it every day. There are so many opportunities that will potentially be missed because we're going to get to the point to where, I mean, we're already at the point. Every second grader in my classroom has a phone in their backpack. And I'm thinking about how can we incorporate these tools in the classroom in a way to where we are supporting our students' understanding of how to use technology properly and not as a means of, as not solely as a means of entertainment, but also as a means of retrieving information in a quick way, right? And I think that this policy as it stands now is going to prohibit us from being bold and courageous about having that type of conversation. And as a district and as a leader in this state, I want to be on the end of innovation and not on the end of prohibiting something, right? I want to be thinking about how are we preparing our students for the future and utilizing these tools that are in their pockets rather than just saying, no, this is not going to work for us. Um, because I think that there, I, I think that largely that would be a missed opportunity on our end. Director Pinkham. Uh, thank you. Yeah, the, we had some um, public comments tonight uh, about this, and uh, uh, Tuesday was talking about how they can be used to help with the partnership that we have with the Selda Public uh, Library because of internet access and being able to access. Uh, electronic books uh, with those devices. I'd be on the side that we should be providing the tools to access that, not expect students to bring the tools in to access it. Uh, because I know that unfortunately they can be distracting. Uh, smart use uh, can be you know, something we can build upon. And, and w if we look at that, it, it's great. Maybe every student in your in someone's class has cell phones, but not every student is going to have a cell phone or an electronic device to bring. Uh, so how much do we then fill that gap of who doesn't have an electronic device? And uh, so that people, again, I, I'd hate to see this become a shaming, oh, look, someone has doesn't have a cell phone and uh, just other opportunities you got to look at. So I would definitely see a need to limit the distraction. Uh, some of the language here is a use of personal devices, not necessarily to own one. It's okay to own one and okay to bring one to school, but using it during instructional time, that's what you know, maybe we need to be managing and making sure that it is constructive, that it isn't someone answering a text, Snapchatting, that can d be distracting. Uh, one of the comments or quotes that I've seen that even the use of it sometimes can be distracting. It can be in your backpack and the students thinking about, ooh, did I get a text message? Did I just hear my <laughs> bag, you know, beep and vibrate? So there, I see that, yeah, maybe there's more doctrine of this, that it isn't necessarily prohibiting it, but helping students doing better manageable use of their electronic devices that they may bring to school. Last, but I, go ahead, Director Mack, go for it. Yeah, um, I appreciate uh, the drafting and the work that's gone into the engagement thus far and um, as Director Burke had kind of mentioned that this policy has been in conversation and, and uh, being worked alongside lots of other things and you know bandwidth is always a challenge um, and I think that some of these points that are being raised by um, my colleagues all three of them that just mentioned them are are really good points um, that need to be considered. As Number first four of all, is the, coming. The, the distraction aspect instead of the prohibition. Um, I do think that we need to be thoughtful about um, how that's framed, um, and I appreciate that. I think Director Percy's comments around um, that our policy pro needs to give some guidance on what we are going to do in terms of um, teaching appropriate. Uh, use of digital technology. Um, this is one of the places where I think we really are somewhat in the Wild West um, and we have these things and that, um, you know, we need to be thoughtful about supporting our students in, in uh, learning responsible behavior uh, with managing their, their digital technology um, and, um, and that we 
we should be tying that into this policy as well as to, I, I think it would be appropriate for us to um, uh, somehow have some curriculum, have some intentional learning around, um, you know, the use of technology and um, that we don't have that now is, is problematic. Um, so I really appreciate uh, Director Hersey's comments on that. And uh, Director um, Hinkham's comments around uh, the issue of using um, individual personal devices in the classroom that are not accessible to all students, I do think is a fundamental equity issue that, um, uh, that, that we need to be careful of um, uh, expecting their use in the classroom. Um, when not everyone has one, not, not everyone has access to them, and that that is um, it's unfair to expect um, uh, students to bring their own and pay for their own materials that are needed to uh, learn. Um, so I do think that's another piece of this that needs to be considered in the policy. Um, and um, the uh, the extent of the community engagement and what's gone on in our schools so far, I think there's actually a lot of information that we haven't uh, brought forward into this bar that uh, would be really helpful for the conversation. Um, having uh, watched and talked with the principal at Hamilton extensively and also the teachers that were involved in, in um, establishing the Away for the Day policy and the, the process that they went through with the community and the, the robust conversations that took place to go from uh, not having a policy to having an Away for the Day policy. Um, I think it's really, it's interesting um, how that transpired and how um, I think as Director Burke mentioned was um, a lot of uh, kind of fear and consternation in the beginning but after it's been implemented, this broad support for the increased um, learning environment and socialization of students in the school, um, with still having access to, you know, being able to call their parents if they need to, um, and uh, you know, from if they're on the bus, having it to and from school, um, but that the reduction in incidents. Um, and I would need to get this specific uh, data from uh, the Hamilton principal, and I think that I would assume it would be available from the other schools that have implemented similar policies, that the incidence of um, social media slash you know, device-related um, issues uh, prior to the um, Director Mack, can you wrap up your comments, yes. please? Thank you. Sorry? Can you wrap Sorry? up your comments, please? Yeah, I just wanted to make the point that the issues that were happening on a weekly basis prior to the implementation was something like, I want to say, six to ten different um, issues would would happen. And then after the away for the day policy was implemented, it's down to like one a month. Um, and that it is it is greatly improved um, school climate. Um, so I think that information would be really helpful to the conversation. And I'm uh, wrapping up my comments. I'm wondering if, um, while I'm excited to move um, a policy forward that uh, will support our students, I'm, I'm wondering if, if these three or four different aspects to the policy might need to be worked on, as well as the community engagement, a little bit further to tighten this up before we try to push it through for our action. Got it, thank you. Director Geary and then I would like to wrap this conversation up, please. Sure, very, very quickly. What I heard there, and I think it's really powerful, is that Hamilton went through a process as a school and a community. And once you go through that process, then you have something that is supported and culturally relevant. And so, again, that's why I would get back to requiring schools to create processes for distraction-free environments and work those out so that they end up with something that can be supported by their community as opposed to what appears to be a top-down that is 
already set up to be resisted. <laughs> okay, I would like to wrap this conversation up and with fair warning to my brother Rick one Burke, question. Director one, Burke. One question, Director Harris? Have at it. If I can go after you if you'd like, but if you want to wrap, I'd, I'll inject now. Inject now. This is a, this is a question for staff, um, and it could be, you know, if, if the answer isn't readily available, it could be uh, presented at a later time. Um, the current policy has a section on page two, section two around filter that indicates all district owned computers capable of accessing the internet must use filtering software to prevent access to obscene, racist, hateful, or violent material. So four months ago, this board approved $13 million worth of computer hardware, put one-to-one -one laptops in our high schools, um, all ninth grades and all grades at equity tiered schools. Um, and so I think one of the prevalent comments from the community surveys that came to the CNI committee indicated that student use of phones was necessary to access content which was blocked by the district firewall. So that feels to me like an alignment problem with our content filtering rather than a need for more widespread use of student devices. So the question then is how much of the filtering that we provide is on the internet backbone and how much of it is at the computer level, i.e. if students choose to tether their district supplied computer to their personal electronic devices, what protect protection do we maintain for our students? Is there anybody in the room here that can answer that from dots, et cetera? Can we get an answer to that question prior to this being scheduled for action? That's a thumbs up, Rick. Thank you. You bet. Um, with fair warning to my valued and trusted colleague, Director Burke, um, I intend to push back extraordinarily vociferously on this for several reasons. One, I feel I would be a hypocrite if I push back on certain policies for um, advanced learning, for instance, if I don't believe there's been enough community engagement and then turn around and vote for this when I don't believe there's been enough community engagement. There is a community engagement tool out there and I don't see it attached and I appreciate that um, there may not be A, the bandwidth or B, the desire of staff to push hard on community engagement from a philosophical standpoint in, in assisting with the away for the day. Um, I have had the opportunity to spend a great deal of time in the recent several weeks with a number of uh, community organizations answering questions and this, this continues to come to the fore. And the input is you didn't ask us. And when we're only talking about 47 responses, I would suggest to you that is beyond st statistically insignificant. I appreciate Hamilton's hard work in coming up with a process. I appreciate the um, props to Asa Mercer. But that's all pretty anecdotal. You said that there is a school district to the north, Everett, that has done a policy. We see none of that research attached here. I appreciate that some terms are coming to an end and that there is a desire to cross the T and dot the I and put one of our passion projects forward and I admire and respect the passion but this is not ready for prime time, both from the race and equity toolkit and the community engagement tool toolkit and I I will absolutely vote against it and argue even more vociferously in two weeks and doing a little community engagement when we haven't done very much is, is worse than not doing any. That's, that's box checking in my world. And, and again, Director Burke, you and I have had this conversation and I love you just the same. Moving President on. Harris? Yes, ma'am. It's mutual. <laughs> I'm wondering if I could make a motion to... Um, Not tonight, you can't. 
I'm sorry? You can't make a motion tonight. This is an intro item, my love. I was going to make a motion to send it back to the CNI committee to have further it's, work done. It's inappropriate the on tonight. an intro item, is my understanding. Is that correct, Chief Narver? He is nodding his head up and down, yes, for you who cannot see him from New York. So um, would I make that motion at on action then, on the day of action? I would suggest collaboration. Keeping in mind the OPMA, getting direction from your board office full of capable folks, and you have Chief Narver's cell phone number, and I strongly encourage you to speak to the experts in the room who frankly were not well graded into this process. But I likened it last night in a public forum to the pendulum swinging back and forth with principals, schools having different policies. The dress code has caused us more lost academic time than we can count, but we managed to come together, get a baseline so that we can be on one page and we can be a school system as opposed to a system of schools. Do I think we need to talk about this? Yes. Can I argue this particular issue of personal electronic devices both ways? Absolutely. Which absolutely tells me this is not ready for prime time. Moving on, please. And we have a time check here. It is 8.52 and we still have some fairly meaty issues to address. Thirteen, approval of the student assignment transition plan for 2021 came before OPS October 3rd for consideration. Approval of this item would approve the student assignment transition plan for 2021 as attached to the board action report. Coming forth is Chief Pedrosa and Director Davies. Thank you. Um, so um, this is my first full school board meeting, so I got to be last on the agenda. Is that, is that, was that meant on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. So now I've been, uh, uh, what is it, uh, christened in this process. So, okay. So we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, the student assignment plan. And so one of the, I know you all have the, a bar in front of you. Uh, one of the things I want us to note with the changes of the student assignment plan listed in front of you, um, one of the changes is changing the location of Licton Springs K-8 to Whitman's service area and updating the Licton Springs geozone to extend to the western boundaries, uh, to the west boundary of the district. Um, the second change to note is expansion of the geozones of Cleveland High School, Cedar Park, South uh, Shore, Hazel Wolf, Orca, K-8, Salmon Bay, Stem, Thornton Creek to align with geozones with the walk zones. Um, the third thing to note is that increase, and so this is a new item in, in, inserted in here based on lots of discussions and conversations. We took out uh, the expansion of the geozones for Green Lake. Instead, we're incorporating into the plan increase of Native heritage set aside of 20% from 15% for John Stanford International Schools and McDonald International Schools. And last, um, the updating advanced learning assignment language and tiebreakers to reflect the fact that all schools offer AL programming and eligible students will be assigned to AL at their attendance area schools. So, and then the other thing I wanted to make sure that you note is during the operations uh, c committee meetings, um, there was language around Taft that was inserted into the student assignment plan. Um, it was requested that uh, we come back with another proposal so that there would be two options to consider. Um, we didn't have time to put that in into this proposal, but we have that uh, proposal here. And I just need to check in terms of process, what the process is to uh, give this to the board, uh, the language, the, the, two, the other, uh, the updated language, the original language, and then the updated language proposal for TAF consideration. 
Chief Narver. <laughs> That's okay. Run it again, please, if you so would. So yeah, please. so at the uh, operations committee meeting, um, there was language regarding Taft into the student assignment plan. Um, during the conversation with the board members there, uh, there was a request to take that out um, and to have our team come up with an additional um, uh, proposal. So we have with us the proposal. So it has the original language that was inserted into the plan and then the additional updated proposal uh, for a secondary piece for the board to consider. And I just was wondering what the process is to um, give to the board. Yes, there, it's new language that would be put in the student assignment plan. Yes, they have. They saw the original one, and they asked us to come back with a proposal for a second, for two options. What about the public notice aspect here? Okay. 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 All right. Okay. Great. All right. I'll give this back. To you. All right. Questions, comments, concerns from my colleagues. I'm sorry we can't be more nimble. That's okay. It frustrates the that's heck out of asked, some of us that's too. That's why I asked for me. the process. <laughs> I didn't want to just hand you, you anything. <laughs> so I I do. Okay, there is Director Pinkham. I see the superintendent. Madam, that's a point of clarification. Yes, so Have my question it. is then, can she just read the two options now? So at least there's a heads up about what those are coming here. They're a, a little bit, they're each, they cover a, a full page, 12 point font, so. Is there a, a, a one page document or something that can be emailed, because I can't. Eden, like, is there something Eden, being handed Eden, out? stop please. Please stop. Sorry. <laughs> we're trying to do right by yeah. policy and law here. Yeah. So we're not gonna be emailing anything this evening. My hope is, is that we could push it up to the board page tomorrow yep. for transparency mm -hmm. and clarity, which is critically important, mm -hmm. especially in this polarized, uh, what's the word I want to say, era. Yep. And get information out to the public so that they can give us their feedback. We'll make sure that that happens. Director Pinkham. Yeah, and during uh, public comment, uh, those parents and mm -hmm. kids from Lincoln Springs were asking about transportation. And the, you do note in the fiscal impact revenue uh, source, uh, the fiscal impact of this action will be the cost of up to two additional buses required to maintain transportation for mm -hmm. Lincoln Springs students with the move to Webster. Students would try to be accommodated with existing rights, although students would be <coughs> Comedy with existing routes. And you note the cost for the bus for 2021 school year will be 83000 Said it. You're just quoting just one year price, so we're only going to provide transportation for one year, or are we going to provide transportation as long as students keep going to Lichten Springs? I don't know how, where we uh, are at that. I'm going to bring um, up uh, Ashley Davies because she's the one working on this project. Hi, Ashley Davies, Director of Enrollment Planning. So the reason why we only have next year's cost is because the year after next, the cost would be different. So um, at that point, uh, the recommendation is continued transportation for those grandfathered uh, students, um, but every year the cost of a bus is likely to increase. Okay, just that it's, I guess for me, it just wasn't clear that the transportation would be provided throughout their time there. It just you know, says that continued bus service to current students, and then when you just quote one year's bus pr price, it, to me it almost somebody can say that, oh, you're just providing one year's worth of transportation. Okay, we can just clarify to um, make it clear that it is 
the um, grandfather transportation would be until they finish their time at Licton Springs. Your question got answered. Director Geary? When I look at this, the um, student assignment plan, it has the same problems that I, why I didn't vote for it last time. Um, I don't agree with the creation of Decatur within my district. I don't agree that Decatur goes to Jane Addams. I think it takes a cohort of students that should be at Eckstein um, away from Eckstein that would support its music programs, would uh, support advanced learning within that environment that would benefit all the students within my district that funnel from the elementary schools into Eckstein, into Roosevelt. Um, I know that's not one of the changes that's come up, but that was why I voted it down last time, and I will vote it down again. Directors Burke and Mack. Yeah, hello. Um, I uh, appreciate the work that staff has gone through to come up with the language around path. And one of the questions that we were raising in committee that um, for me is important to understand is when do we have a um, kind of decision on whether or not path is going to happen for 2020? When, it, when does that get secured? Do we have information at this point about uh, when that agreement will be put in place and have it solidified that this is the programming that will be happening for 2020 so that we can know that prior to voting on this change? Superintendent Juno, please. So we, there's been engagement ongoing. We don't quite have it solidified yet, um, but we were out with staff recently and visited with them about maybe taking a creative approach, which is per their CBA, which would allow them some flexibility about different alternative kind of programming to happen. They decided and voted not to go creative approach way. Um, and so we are continuing engagement. There is an engagement Saturday um, for families of feeder schools to come in and learn more about what the TAF program is. And so we're continuing to engage. There's not a solid yes yet. But in order, I mean, so it's sort of the chicken and the egg again, because in order for there to be a true TAF program, so, I mean, I think the language that's going to be proposed, like if, right, TAF comes, then it, the HC pathway is different. Is that correct? So, so we, we had talked about that as potential language. The challenge with having that type of language in the plan as it exists is that the plan will live on once it's approved for another year. And then that could be kind of confusing if we then several months later decide that we're not moving forward. So um, there was a discussion about potentially adding um, an amendment after the fact, um, but putting language if um, takes away from the consistency in the way things are described in the plan given the fact that it's a reference for our families. And uh, for clarification, thank you, uh, Superintendent Juno. For clarification, does that so some one of the options that staff has come up with for language has the word "if" in it, so that no, no. Uh, so we just said that it does not uh, have "if." Yeah. The, what we had um, initially proposed and what we um, had also drafted up. <coughs> The idea of the pathway, there's no change in that. So um, Washington would continue to be the pathway for families who are highly capable. Um, the change that was initially recommended and even the additional language just talks about the fact that um, uh, Washington would not have the, um, be considered a cohort model. 
with the updated language, we don't necessarily have to talk about Washington in and of itself. Um, it would only necessarily be something that applies to, um, let's see, yes. So we actually just, if, if it's possible, if there's just one line, I think that we could probably just read the line um, that would provide a little bit more clarity. So what we are suggesting is adding in the section that talks about the highly capable cohort from students entering sixth grade uh, would be beginning in fall of 2020, um, HCC students in the cohort at Thurgood Marshall will have the option to attend their Pathway Middle School, Washington Middle School, and continue receiving HC services in a blended model. So, um, and that essentially, again, is to indicate that there would not be a cohort at Washington. Beginning at sixth grade, obviously. Director Burke, Director Mack. Um, I'd like to just see if I could raise a comment that I think came up um, fairly extensively in operations uh, around the dual language immersion pathway. If that is uh, if that is in order, it is um, in order. Continue, please. Perfect. The uh, in in operations, you know, we were acknowledging the the 2017 work of the dual language immersion task force that was recommending uh, a, a target of 30 percent or greater uh, set aside for heritage speakers. We acknowledge that to implement that at McDonald and John Stanford would not in any way help the Green Lake Elementary uh, enrollment crunch or capacity crunch. Um, so there was a desire to put something, put some language in place that um, spoke to that aspiration. Um, and I think the, uh, you know, what's in there now is a 20% uh, increase from 15% to 20%. Um, but it doesn't acknowledge the dual language immersion task force or their 2017 recommendation. So I guess I would request if we could specifically acknowledge that just to create the linkage back to that work. So that's door number one. And then number two is an extension of that conversation is we didn't want to just be creating policy for individual schools. And I think the um, staff was going to reach out to other um, dual language immersion schools and understand the, the imp implications of if we applied that heritage speaker uh, set aside for schools that may potentially already have that number in it of heritage speakers, but they may not be using a specific uh, identification process or just to understand if, if we applied it district-wide, would that have an adverse consequence? And I, I didn't see any of that language in here. I was wondering if we could hear from that um, at this time. Yes, we are actually, our, um, the manager of the dual language program has been working with us and actually has reached out to all the principals and is collecting that data. And he's actually gone out to meet with the Dearborn Park elementary principal. And so we are starting to gather that information, but we've heard from them and um, they're excited about us aligning that. I mean, so for overall, there's excitement about aligning that for native language speakers, um, but just we wanted to make sure, too, because of the neighborhood. Like, I know Concord and other schools have different populations and different issues to deal with in terms of their languages, um, but we're starting that process. Would that, would that affect the um, cap that we have heard about so much from Dearborn Park, the cap on enrollment? If we had more native speakers, then would it follow that we would lose fewer speakers in the upper grades? Um, so in terms of that particular question, when we had our discussion at the Operations Committee, we talked about, as Director Burke mentioned, the consistency between what we would be applying to all the different schools. And um, we have five uh, dual language immersion schools, two of which are option, and then three of which are attendance area elementaries. 
uh, last year and continuing this year, um, we have heard from Dearborn Park community about um, the fact that there are students who want to attend who haven't been able to, um, and that was the cap that you were essentially referencing. Given the fact that that's an attendance area school, um, in order to allow additional native students in, we'd have to apply something um, particular um, to let them in. Otherwise, right now, because there are 10 zero schools, families apply just like any other families. Any family across the district has the ability to apply to any attendance area school. Um, and those three um, dual language immersion schools that are also attend area schools don't have any special tiebreakers or priority for native students. So our discussion also was about if that was something we were interested in looking at for a 20 or 30 percent native goal, we would probably need to discuss having some other way to ensure that we were able to get that because um, right now any student, whether they're native or not, has the ability to apply and would have equal access um, through the lottery. I did just also want to address um, door number one that Director Burke mentioned. Um, and so that first comment about the reference to the uh, work of the Dual Language Immersion Task Force, so if that is desired, we can make a note in the bar. Um, that language, though, is not something that would fit within the student assignment transition plan um, because that's more of a discussion piece and history piece. It's not necessarily relevant to what is policy. So um, we can add that in the background of the bar, but I would say that isn't something that would go in the student assignment transition plan itself. Just wanted to clarify. Director Pinkham. I don't know if you can answer this, but one thing I just think about fiscal impact. What's the fiscal impact to Robert Eagle staff uh, once Lichten Spring vacates? Are we going to have to remodel that, that wing of the building? Um, is it going to be shut down for a year as they do that remodel? Because I heard one comment saying now they're digging out the hillside to put in more portables at the site. Um, so do we know what that fiscal impact is going to be to either what a retrofit we have to do to the current Licton Springs site. So um, I think the question is what additional work will have to be done to Webster to accommodate Licton Springs as a K-8? Or is the question no, no, about no. Robert Eagle question staff? About Robert Eagle staff or current Licton Springs is housed. What's going to happen with that? What's the transition plan for that portion of the building? Is it going to be ready to use next year for Robert Eagle staff or are we going to have some transition time? So um, I will have to get some more specific details from the capital planning and projects team. Some of the spaces that Licton Springs is occupying um, have been uh, retrofitted to fit them given the nature of their needs. So there is a possibility that they may do some work on some of the rooms, but I don't know um, enough detail to be able to describe any more than that. I just wonder if we can consider that a fiscal impact you know, good to see that, you know, Licton Springs is saying, hey, it looks like we'll have a permanent home now, the next place to grow, and we list the busing, but then there's also the cost to change a school from a K-8 to a middle school. I have a question that has remained unanswered, and, and I am um, channeling Director DeWolf as well because he has uh, pinged on to that question. Um, a good piece of last year, we talked about moving a feeder school from the Asa Mercer Middle School reference area to Washington Middle School. I've sent three emails, and I've gotten crickets back. What, where are we on that conversation and discussion? Because it's my understanding it is vastly out of uh, sync in terms of enrollment. Yeah, so we put something in on the Friday Minimal from last week regarding some of that information, but at this time, our focus has been focusing on the southeast boundary, 
um, that would be, as you know, a lot of community engagement that would have to go wrap around for any consideration of a middle school boundary. And one of the things that we are talking with families when we do these engagement sessions, that has come up, um, but our focus has been about the elementary boundaries and the impact of families within um, the Southeast boundary issue for now, but that hasn't come up in terms of redefining the middle school boundaries at this time. But we do, it is coming up, and we do, we do understand that it's, um, it's gonna probably have to have some engagement down the road. One of the other considerations um, that was part of that was given the work that was happening in engagement around Washington and TAF, um, adding an additional layer to those conversations, um, we had anticipated that we would at least give that transition a year um, before we were discussing additional changes like boundary changes. Thank you for that, much appreciate. Any other comments, questions, concerns from my colleagues? Number 14 and last agenda item and we have 916 time check. Approval of Southeast Elementary Attendance Area Boundary Changes in 2021 and 21-22. This came before OPS October 3rd for consideration. Mm -hmm. Approval of this item would approve scenario X for the Maple Elementary and X Elementary attendance areas as outlined in attachment A mm -hmm. beginning in 2021 would approve scenario X for the Rising Star Elementary and Wing Luke Elementary attendance areas as outlined in attachment A beginning in 2021-22 and would direct the superintendent to take any appropriate action to implement this decision. Great. Take and it away, Chief Pedroza. And thank you for uh, highlighting the emphasis on X because that was one of the things that I emphasized with families as they were leaving because they were asking me, is this a decision? And I'm like, no, this is an introduction and actually we're still waiting for feedback, so we'll get to that. Um, just a quick little background that in February 2013, um, as you know, that they began these conversations around Southeast boundaries. So it, we are now, what, six years later, <laughs> five and a half years later, and we are here again. Um, so just one of the issues that came up with around that and rethinking about how to get at these Southeast boundary discussions is engagement, engagement from the entire community. So one of the things that I can share since coming on board and w sitting in on some of these meetings is there has been lots of engagement since then. A work group has been developed that has analyzed with the enrollment planning team all of the different scenarios, data, have looked at a variety of data points and hold you up a minute when yep. you say a work group has been developed can yep. you talk a little more about what that really yep. means yep. in the day-to-day -day yep so they've care. met over time uh, monthly uh, they've actually had representatives from each of the uh, affected schools and including the principals and so they've met over time every month to review data to look at slides to look at maps to come up with suggestions to apply racial equity analysis through the process, um, to get feedback from their constituents and back and forth. So this has been ongoing. Um, the last meeting that I attended before this last one was there was a planning team that discussed, so how do we engage with the broader community? What needs to happen to take this out to the larger community? The committee actually narrowed it down to three scenarios that you have attached in your um, on the bar. And the three scenarios are listed as, um, I'll just go through it really quickly. Um, we have scenarios. The three scenarios listed here are uh, that we're proposing. These ones don't have this one. Is this it A? D? This doesn't say that here. Yeah, D, F, and G. That's right, because that's what we did at the community engagement session. D, F, and G are the scenarios. Finally, I want to just add that um, when they came up with a plan, there was intentionality around how to support bilingual families. So that was also created. We had translators at the session. We just had the engagement session with the community on October 10th. Um, we had five languages represented and the room was pretty full. Even the middle school principals, Aki and Mercer, also attended as well. And so I just want to share that uh, in terms of engagement, they have really tried to be inclusive of all the different stakeholder groups and find different ways to communicate. So they actually spent a lot of time giving their feedback in the room. And actually, Ashley's team has already compiled, initially compiled some of that data. They're going to have that ready for a presentation to send to you all 
Um, uh, and they're also collecting data from the So Talk. Uh, so let's talk. Um, we're also using that as a platform as well. So we've had the in-person data collection. We're actually collecting data online. You, of course, are receiving emails <laughs> as, as data points as well. But we're going to compile all that data so that you can look at that and see what the, the entire community is saying and what they're talking about or what is the impact, how do we think about other barriers. They're considering all of the elements when they're making the recommendations. Um, so in front of you, you have the, the maps, you have the plan, and we are wanting to move this forward in terms of next steps. And I just, Ashley, if you have any questions for Ashley as well in terms of process or any piece, she's here as well to answer questions. How did we, excuse me, how did we reach out to the meetings? Did we send out in the top five languages, kid mail, email, text? What, what did we do to bring people in yeah. to find out where on the continuum are we here? I will let you answer that question. So we created um, meeting uh, notices in the translated in the top five languages, and those were sent out. We also put together a short um, text message uh, that fit the characters that could go via text, and we sent those out to our schools. Um, it's also been great to have that small working group because those um, parents and principals uh, were able to help share information. So parents were willingly um, and eager to help us communicate via the channels that they have. Um, there are several of the communities that have their own um, language specific chat groups, platforms, forums, and so we were able to customize the messages so that that could be sent out through those different channels. Terrific, thank you. Director Mack, please. Yeah, um, a point of clarification at this stage, we are in intro on the boundaries, and I'm, I'm not understanding whether or not staff has presented a recommendation or not as to one of the three. Are we, are we at a stage where we have three that are there, but we don't actually have a recommendation, so it's we don't have a very specific boundary recommendation at this point, or is there one that is recommended? And if, if there is one that's recommended, can we highlight that? And if there isn't, when do we have that recommendation put forward? So we have a plan in place for that. One, we haven't received all the data yet. So we're still, ex we're still having data come in. Um, we actually have even have one more um, engagement session. Uh, Director Hersey is uh, going to be having a session with uh, Southeast families because some have reached out to us and said they couldn't make the last one. And Ashley will be there to answer questions uh, at that session. So we're still collecting data. Um, we will actually then have that data compiled. You will have this, and then the cabinet will have it. And then the cabinet will review the data, edit, and we will present some, some our initial thinking around the data, and then we'll give it to you so that you can also have it. You'll have the same data. So whatever data the cabinet looks at, the school board will also have as well. And how will we push that back out to the community um, in two weeks or Well, however I think many. if it goes to the board, it has to be on uh, public record. So that's one way. But we can think of other ways. I mean, we've been pretty intentional about collecting. I, I appreciate yeah. that. But how do we close yeah. the loop, if you will? Can you talk about that? You ask us what we yeah. thought. Then you made a decision. Yeah. And it's already a foregone conclusion. Yeah. And, and we're accused of that yeah. on a fairly regular basis. So when we break trust, I want to make sure that we are following through. Yeah, I'll let you go. And so one of the, um, one of the pieces around being really um, careful and thoughtful and um, taking our time in reviewing the feedback that we received from both the community meeting um, as well as the additional engagement and then um, online through Let's Talk and other channels is to be able to summarize. And what we've been doing for our community engagements over the past few years is summarizing a what we've heard, and that goes back on the website, goes back out to families to say, we've had these engagements, we provided this information, this is what we heard, so that there is a connection between the recommendation and what we've heard from families. So that will go back out to families at the time that we have a recommendation prior to um, the point when we have action happening, so that families do have the ability to provide um, any additional information they want to to the board before action is actually taken. 
Thank you. President Harris? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I see that this is set for action on November 6th, which is, which is the next board meeting. Am I correct? Yeah, it's, it's set for action in two weeks, and we don't, we haven't daylighted which proposal we're planning to act on. And so I'm, I'm wondering, from a board perspective, how we, how, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, just, I'm really confused because I think in the past there's always been an intro, a specific proposal about what the boundaries were to be and not having one at this stage. Um, I don't know what we're going to be voting on in action. So I, I'd like clarification procedurally how, what is being introduced? What are we supposed to be voting on in two weeks? So based off the feedback we've received thus far, um, we have three scenarios that are part of this introduction. And we anticipate that our recommendation would be one of these three scenarios, again, based off the feedback that we've received. So the sequence of our November 6th requested action is just essentially following the here we are presenting at intro. Um, we recognize that we wanted this board to be able to vote on that. So that gives us the 6th or the 20th. Um, if the board feels more comfortable voting on the 20th, um, I don't know what we would do with the 6th. If the 6th would then be another opportunity to review more information publicly. Um, it just seemed as if whether we, uh, whether the board felt ready or not, again, every time we discuss it, it's more opportunity for um, the public to hear as well as the board to get information. Would you be distressed by moving it to the 20th? So there would be no discussion on the 6th? I didn't say that. Okay. Action on the 20th. We can bring it back up for additional intro input. Finish the communication loop that I, I don't want to short sheet it yeah. at the end of what on its face looks like a really good process. And, and a year ago, there were people practically throwing chairs in this room on this issue because we didn't lay the groundwork and the communication. And, and I'm really proud of the fact that we're learning to do better. So everything we've communicated to families has said the 6th or the 20th, okay. understanding that the way things were going, um, we just wanted to make sure that this board would have the opportunity to vote on it. But um, I am not, I won't be distressed if you vote on the 20th. I imagine there will be some families who are just eager to know, but we, you know, we want to be thoughtful with how we make these decisions. Director Harris, Geary, I think excuse me, back. excuse me. Director Geary, then Director Mack, then Director Hersey. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to highlight um, Matthew Purcell. I think that was who spoke. Mm -hmm. I want to highlight his comment because even last year when this conversation came up, I was not sure that we weren't dealing with a lot of bias from the community about what is a good school in Seattle Public Schools, what's a desirable school, and who the students look like in those schools. So he sort of was the first, first person who I have heard testify on this that highlighted that particular acknowledgement. And I just want to sort of underline it an exclamation point that, again, we as a building have done a lot of work to identify biases and try to address them. That is not work that has necessarily been echoed throughout all of our communities in spite of our efforts to do that. So I just throw that out there. We're talking about good schools. We're talking about schools that we challenge to be better. We have to have high expectations for all of our schools. And I just, I, I want us to be mindful 
of what some of these conversations, what the hidden, hidden unsaid things may be, because Matthew Persault at least had the guts to acknowledge where he was coming from last year. And, and for what it's worth, there's a fair amount out there in the Georgetown community on social media that echoes some of that. But again, net well, and split. When you look at the map, it does look like Georgetown has been lumped up and shipped off. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look elegant. It doesn't look like it grows well. Well, and there's but, a freeway and a whole lot of things. But that's what we've done. Yeah. Um, and why have we done that? Who who is it that isn't moving, and why aren't we asking them to move? Director Mack and then Director Hersey. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that I, I appreciate the thought. It sounded like what you suggested was that we would have another conversation on the agenda about this in the intro for the next meeting. Um, I guess the second intro, I don't know procedurally how that works, but that the actual proposal with the information about the community engagement, et cetera, would come forward at that time. <laughs> and then it would be voted on for action on the 20th. You got it, Director, Director Hersey, you got it. Yeah, that's, so I'm just, I, I, to me that makes sense what you proposed. Okay, we got it. Thank you. You have your marching orders. Thank you for your flexibility. Thank you, so much. Thank Thank you, you for your hard work. And we are adjourned at 931. Thanks all. Oh, Bye everyone, have a great evening. Bye. Bye.